Adam Kadmon, the Kabbalistic being of perfection. So to succinctly put it, to my prior extrapolation of this concept, the Adam Elion or Adam Kadmon will be androgynous and thus will be the physical merging of the divine male and female aspects into one form, the ending of all dualities and dualisms present within the world, the establishing of man as a god, a god-man if you will, the merging of man into god, of which I will touch upon later in greater detail. It is the central theme of the Kabbalistic eschatology or end times prophecy, where they wish to bring back the world to a state close to Genesis, to Tikkun and Bohu, chaos and the void. The Hebrew could mean devoid of life. Think of this depopulation agenda ongoing. They will then, like order from chaos or order out of chaos, order ab chao, remake the world anew and raise the remains of man up to a type of omnipresent superorganism. This is what Kabbalah teaches from my readings of the Zohar, primarily. So to recap, to bring back man into the fold of the pre-fall, that means prior to the eating of the apple. They have to destroy the world. They have to create the Halam Hatou, which roughly is the world of chaos. Then they will have the Tikkun Olam, which is the world of rectification, the world that has been corrected, rectified. This again is the main concept behind the Noahide laws. They wish to remake and reorder. I hope this makes sense, so this is where this idea of order out of chaos comes from. It is a Kabbalistic uh, precept, to put it succinctly. So continuing on, the main goals of Kabbalah. So if we look at the number 11, and specifically that of 9-11, we find something very interesting. 9-11 is significant in the occult and the Kabbalah. It may reflect the two stages of unity at the top of the Sephirot, the Keter and Da'at. 9-11 being 9 plus 1 plus 1 equals 11, and 9-11 is the 254th day of the year. 2 plus 5 plus 4 equals 11. Moreover, from a rabbi, he states that, quote, 11 refers to the conveyance of the divine light, which transcends the limits of the world within the limits of the world. Quote, the world was created with 10 utterances. He means the sephirot there, the 10 sephirot or vessels, unquote. 11 thus refers to a level above the limits of that set. Nevertheless, since it is also a number which follows in sequence to 10, we can understand that it refers to the fusion between the transcendent divine light and the framework of limited worldly existence, unquote. This is why Bush Sr. used the, quote, a thousand points of light, unquote, allegory. Coincidentally, 10 years to the date prior to 9-11, on September the 11th, 1991. Continuing on, as Kabbalah speaks of an eventuality where man will join with God, and become the Ein Sof, the infinite, which is sometimes symbolized as light entering singularly through a point into a vacuum comprised of ten concentric circles, symbolizing the Sephirot or tree of life or knowledge, depending on the rabbinical scholar. Anthropomorphically, as modern Kabbalah, Luraic Kabbalah, states that this will be done through the Adam Elion Kadmon upper man concept. As a tangential point, I will get into this later on, but we understand with the Kaaba, the Islamic holy site within Mecca, that they circle round the black stone as part of their pilgrimage, their Hajj. Now, I've just discussed as well this idea of the vacuum comprised of the ten concentric circles and the Ein Sof, the infinite light of God, entering through a singular point through the middle of this and providing substance to the vacuum. Continuing on, the Adam Elion Kadmon will become God as he will be infinite and will have a collective consciousness. Again, that links to uh, the singularity and the global brain that is spoken of by cybernetics. He will also be the union of male and female androgynous. Just to recap, quote, nonetheless, Adam Kadmon is divine light without vessels, without the vessels of the Sephirot, 
that is, the ten, i.e. pure potential. In the human psyche, Adam Kadmon corresponds to the Yahida, the collective essence of the soul, unquote. Again, goes to the global brain singularity, so we even see the Fin Kabbalah, they have specific terminology for the collective essence of the soul, the Yahida. Also, this corresponds to the Sephirot as the highest point, the Keter, or crown. So, I just wish to reiterate as well, because again, this is a very important point, this really shows the reasoning behind what is going on right now. So prior to this Adam Kadmon, there will be an Olam Hatohu, a world in chaos, which will precipitate the purifying Shivira, or the shattering of the vessels, or the ten stages that make up the Sephiroth. This will lead the world back into the genesis of Tohu and Bohu, chaos and the void. The void is very important. Think of depopulation and devastation, almost a return to endless wilderness. Again, this links to the alchemical stages, that being one must destroy and putrefy to then transmogrify the base material into gold. The quote I read of Crowley regarding the rainbow and the alchemical processes on the previous video, if I recall correctly, alludes to this concept. Continuing on, after this, the Olam Hatikun, the world of rectification, will occur and the new Adam Kadmon will emerge, the union of God and man, an androgynous hive mind esque superorganism, the goal of the modern concept of the singularity, pushed by Norbert Wiener, Ray Kurzweil, and Bern Gortzel, as I previously stated, of the end goal of Kabbalah, as discussed within the Zohar, then one can see this as evident with the modern adoption of the Star of David, that being the symbolic union of male and female, the Ein Sof and Shekinah in Kabbalah, via the intertwined triangles, that's what that symbolises, one pointing up and one pointing down. This is on the reverse of the dollar bill, which spells Mason. Recall too that the square and compass are symbolic representations of this too. The eye at the top of the pyramid is the top of the Tetractis, the Pythagorean representation of the Hebraic god that adds to 72, plus the missing part, Adam Kadmon, which equals the completed 73. Again, this links to Cicada, as Cicada states that both primes and the totient function are sacred. Now, I do not wish to bore you, but this involves an intermediate level of number theory, of which I will not delve into here in too much detail, but I will bring to your attention the most pertinent points surrounding this. You see, 73 is a prime number, quite a special one, but I will delve into that a little later on. And if we understand something regarding the, quote, sacred totient function, as described by Cicada, then we understand that the formula to determine the totatives, or the number of relatively prime numbers relative to a prime, in this case 73, is phi, bracket p, close bracket, equals bracket p minus 1, close bracket. Essentially, this means that the phi, or number of relatively prime numbers relative to this prime is 72. This is due to the variable p or prime minus 1 in the formula, thus 73 minus 1, which obviously equals 72. Much akin to the Kabbalistic concept that during the fall God lost a part of his being, an aspect of himself, through the betrayal by his creation by eating of the forbidden fruit. And we see how this sacred theory regarding primes and co-primes, totatives, makes sense in an esoteric manner, as Kabbalah seeks to unify or rectify the world that fell during the events within the Garden of Eden. This is then mirrored within these sacred numbers, and how they are written into scripture and formatted within secular number theory. We must be aware too that the universe's language, or patterned existence, is predicated upon mathematics. It permeates in the universe in its fullest sense, and thus, like the Masonic, great architect of the universe, God is a spirit of geometry, order, and mathematical formulation. 
is according to cicada, masonry, Kabbalah, and all forms of mysticism. Naturally, this is very Pythagorean in its dogma, that of the cult originating in ancient Samos, and not specifically the mathematician of whom was revered by the eponymously titled cult. The reason this is Pythagorean in its dogma, as can be seen in the Tetractis of Kabbalah, is because Kabbalah and by consequence masonry is an offshoot of ancient Greek mystery schools, of which we can trace the veracity of that back to the, some could say, proto kabbalist of Philo of Alexandria. Encapsulating all of this is the understanding that, prior to Philo of Alexandria, within the 1st century AD, and the latter part of the 1st century BC, we find that during the Greco-Roman and previous Hellenic, Seleucid and Ptolemaic reign over Judea, that there was a real schism within the country regarding the cultural and religious osmosis between the old Judean traditions and encroaching foreign Hellenic traditions. In fact, it is not well known today, but many Jews and Samaritans during those times did actually Hellenize and begin worshipping other deities alongside Yahweh, even going so far to indulge in non-kosher practices, customs and food. For all intents and purposes, Judea was very much a slowly Hellenizing province. However, this would all revert, quite decisively so, during the bloody affair of the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucid Empire, of which is still celebrated today within the festival of Hanukkah. Although this is something that has existed throughout the lifespan of the precursor Abrahamic religion, that being that the fundamentalist and rabbinical hierarchy are in a constant struggle to dissuade their lower order brethren from integrating fully into the foreign host society. Digressing, recall that at the beginning of the discussion, and also note that 73 links to the gematria value of Genesis 1-1, which adds to 2701. I also wish to state as well, 73 is a very important number. That is, 73 is an emerp, which means that the reverse of 73, that is 37, is also a prime number. 73 is the 21st prime number, while 37 is the 12th prime number. Moreover, it is a star number. Now, what is a star number? Well, a star number is a centred figurate number upon a centred hexagram, or a star of David. Now, why is this important? Well, it just so happens that every occult number, 1, 13, 37, 73, 33, 21, it is also a star prime. That being a star number, that is also a prime. We see within 9-11 that there were extremely interesting numbers that emerged with Flight 93 regarding star numbers. 93 itself is a star number and United comes to 73 in Gematria, a star number. And there were 33 passengers on board, which is another star number. Maybe there is no connection here. But it is quite strange the overlap of these numbers and thus, I wish to bring this to the fore. Moreover, one of the most unique star numbers, as all of its prime factors are star numbers 13, 73 and 37, is the number 35,113. In Gematria, this comes to 222, of which has Kabbalistic significance due to its relation to one of the terms of the Mashiach, Yeshua, or, in Hebrew, salvation through Yah. And it also has a relation to the firstborn term within Hebrew, which in turn links to the Simsum, or God's divine light creating the world. I will discuss the Simsum in more detail in future videos. However, digressing, this ties in further with the Metatron cube, which is a, quote, very complex two-dimensional geometric figure made from 13 circles of the same size. Recall, 13 is a star number, with lines extending from the centre of every circle to the centre of all the other 12 circles, unquote. It has the Star of David, essentially encircled and squared, with a square or cube clearly visible from this. This most likely links to the black cubes worshipped by these individuals, 
the cube on the forehead of the rabbi, of which has the Hebrew number and letter Shin inscribed on one of the faces of it. Funnily enough, this letter Shin or number Shin comprising three vavs or sixes, however, officially it is the number 300. Moreover, the letter Shin was designed into the logo of the 1992 Rio conference, of which was then produced Agenda 21, the action plan for the 21st century. Continuing on, the cube at the Kaaba. The modern findings of this is a black cube monument in every major metropolis of the West, for it was said that, quote, Saturday, Shabbat in Hebrew, and Saturn, Shabbatai in Hebrew, is the reference to Saturn as the planet in charge of the Jews, unquote. Hence, the Metatron cube, it is the representation of the Keter, the crown, the highest point of the spiritual growth, the merging with the divinity, in the modern context through the black veins of the singularity and AI. Funnily enough, the Romans and Greeks thought Saturn evil, and hence this is why Christians changed their day of worship from Saturn's day, Saturday, to Sunday, the day of Apollo or Helios. Recall too, this goes further back to Yah or Yahweh being a storm and warrior deity, also a moon deity too. Saturn has a perpetual storm in the shape of a hexagram on its north pole. And Yah was also a moon god when the Hyksos or Habaru Hebrews were pharaohs of Egypt. This is all Kabbalah. Eustace Mullins stated within his work, The Curse of Canaan, that, quote, In 1280 AD, a further development of Talmudic thought, the Zohar, or Book of Splendor, appeared. This was known as the Kabbal, or tradition. It was based on two things. One, generation or the fertility rites as the most sacred word in the new instructions, which, of course, always became the G featured in Masonic symbols, the seventh letter that is. And two, the precept that Israel alone is to possess the future world, Vaishle, folio 177b. The Zohar, derived from the Sefer Yitzra, or Book of Creation, which had appeared in the Babylon of the 3rd century, the Ten Sephiroth, or Numbers, based on the belief that the universe derives from the Ten Numbers and two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This is where the Twelve Disciples comes in, too. This later was developed into the 22 Trumps of Tarot, or the 22 Paths, which led to the Sephiroth. This also harkens back to our discussion on the number 222, and its significance. Furthermore, in regards to United Airlines 93, the phrase United Airlines flight sums to 222 in Gematria, something else to also consider. Continuing on, in Kabbalah, evil takes on a mysterious existence of its own, which its precepts trace back to the physical appearance of life on earth, or Adam. Kabbalah claims that Adam throws the entire stream of life out of balance and that the church, or Christianity, by formalising the physical existence of the Adamite people on earth, have become a problem which must be resolved. This is the essence of the basic anti-life principle underlying all Kabbalah, and it's there, Freemasonry. These precepts declare that Satanism, or Kabbalah, will achieve its final triumph over the church and Christianity, thus ending the dualism of the world. The struggle between good and evil. In short, the problem of good and evil will be ended when evil triumphs and good is eliminated from the earth. This program may sound somewhat simplistic, but it is the basic premise of the Kabbalah and Freemasonry. Thus, Kabbalistic Freemasonry aims for the extermination of life as we know it. This was written in the 1950s if I recall correctly, I may be wrong in that regard. But it was written many, many, many years ago. And again, he gleaned this from the Zohar, the Sefer Yitzhara, and the Kabbalistic doctrine. I will just repeat that because it is so important. We keep seeing this idea of extermination. Crowley stated it too. And so did uh, the distillation explanation of the middle stage of the alchemical process. So I will repeat it. Uh, Eustace Mullins states, Thus, Kabbalistic Freemasonry aims for the extermination of life as we know it. 
culminating in the final triumph of the Canaanite curse on this earth. In retrospect, this amazing observation offers an irrefutable reason for the otherwise inexplicable massacres, wars and human devastation which have been regularly visited upon a long-suffering humanity by the Canaanite conspirators. It was the predominant element in secular humanism which led to the revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries and which had previously led to the Reformation. These political results were the logical outcome of the teachings of the Zohar, which declares that Ein Sof, the ultimate deity or the infinite, brought the world into being in an indirect manner, in order to avoid being contaminated by physical being or life. This again expresses the basic anti-life direction of this philosophical system. Orthodox Jews base their religious practices entirely on the Kabbalah. They celebrate their coming triumph, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is defined in the Zohar as the period when they triumph over all the peoples of the world. Quote, that is why during this feast we seize the lulab and carry it as a trophy to show that we have conquered all the other people, the populace. Unquote. Toldoth, Noah 63b. Unquote. A very long quote, uh, indeed. But the book is a gem and is key to understanding this entire Kabbalistic web of conspiracy. Mullins goes on to state further on in the book about the Masons and the Golden Dawn, showing that they are all mere offshoots of Kabbalah. Stay tuned, I will discuss Gershom Sholem and his rather enlightening concept again reiterating this potential extermination that will happen prior to their world to come, so to say, their Haolam Haba. So stay tuned for that, please. <laughs>